yet had an opportunity to finish. All right, everyone. Well, needless to say, terrorism is an international phenomenon. What happens abroad has a direct impact on the lives of Americans here at home and our safety and our security. And one of the goals for the forum is, as I've said beforehand, is to ensure that all the relevant national security, homeland security related agencies are, are dealt with during the course of the forum. And uh, we're now turned to the State Department. And to give us the State Department's perspective on this issue, we have Dan Benjamin. Dan is the uh, ambassador at large, the coordinator for counterterrorism at the State Department. Prior to his appointment, Ambassador Benjamin was the director of the Center on the United States in Europe and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Before that, he was a senior fellow in Washington at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and he also served on the National Security Council staff and as a special assistant and speechwriter to President Clinton. Dan also had a career as a journalist. Uh, before entering government, he was a for cor foreign correspondent for Time Magazine and also for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, he has written, co-written two books, The Age of Sacred Terror and the most recent one, The Next Attack. And he's been published in numerous uh, publications over the course of his long and storied career. And moderating uh, this session is Dan Claydman. Dan is a former uh, managing editor at Newsweek until this past February. Uh, from 2001 until 2006, he was the magazine's Washington bureau chief. And Dan is currently writing a book on the Obama administration's handling of counterterrorism policy. And that book will be out in the spring of 2012. And we look forward very much to featuring that at next summer's forum, Dan. So thank you very much. And now to you. Uh, well, thank you very much. I um, uh, just want to mention one thing about your resume. You mentioned the book, uh, The uh, Sacred Age of Terror, which uh, was really uh, indispensable reading uh, for journalists, uh, policymakers, academics. Uh, it came out in 2002. Anybody uh, who wanted to understand the sources uh, of radicalism that, that led to 9-11 um, and how to address some of those underlying drivers um, of, uh, of, of extremist uh, violence. Um, and um, uh, you did that while you were, uh, I think, mostly in uh, think tanks. Um, and, uh, you know, you can debate to what extent uh, the Bush administration adopted some of the ideas that were in your book. I think you think not as much as they should have, uh, and others might disagree. But now you've been in government uh, for two years. Uh, two and a half years in a position to try to execute um, some of those uh, ideas and implement them. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, how that's going so far. Um, but first, uh, uh, do us a favor and just very briefly uh, give us a, uh, uh, a sense of what your role is in the, uh, the counterterrorism community, your role at the State Department. Sure. Uh, and first of all, thanks uh, to Clark and to you, Dan, for the very kind introduction, and thanks in particular for Clark, to Clark for uh, having me uh, this year, uh, particularly after I bailed out on him at the last minute uh, last year. So I uh, appreciate his, um, his uh, merciful intervention there uh, because it is always great to be in Aspen. Um, obviously, the State Department is the lead uh, U.S. agency uh, in foreign policy. So there's an awful lot uh, that we have to say and to do uh, with regard to counterterrorism policy. Uh, when we're deliberating internally, uh, the State Department has to look at the totality of uh, foreign policy and figure out how our, uh, our counterterrorism actions are going to affect that policy and when, whether particular actions are wise. Um, obviously, the, uh, you know, a lot of what has been spoken about uh, in this conference thus far is the kinetic part of uh, counterterrorism, but there's a lot more to it. And, um, you know, it's become a truism within uh, the administration, and I think outside as well, uh, that we cannot shoot our way out of this one. And this has been uh, adverted to by many people who have uh, been up here on the stage. And at the State Department, I think we view our role in particular to be thinking about uh, the long term and, and think, trying to think strategically about how we uh, do some of those things that uh, don't involve shooting, and uh, specifically, 
I view our, our sort of two main uh, concerns as being what are we going to do to diminish recruitment because as long as there are more people coming out of the woodwork and joining these groups, uh, we've got a big problem on our hand. And there may be some coming out of the woodwork forever, but uh, we will certainly increase our national security uh, if we diminish those numbers. And the other thing is, what can we do to both strengthen our international partnerships, which are absolutely crucial, and to give others uh, the means they need to deal with the threats they face? Because it's obviously in our uh, deepest uh, interest uh, for others to deal with the threats in their countries, in their regions, so that we don't have to intervene because obviously intervention carries with it all kinds of costs and blood and treasure, but also potentially in terms of our radicalization. So you, you anticipated my next question, which is uh, we have talked a lot about the operational and the kin kinetic side. We've talked about uh, the, the strategic defeat of, of Al Qaeda, of knockout punches, uh, but the area that you're talking about is a little gauzier, and it's a little harder to assess uh, uh, progress. It's easier when you can tally up captures and kills. Um, so uh, give us a sense, as, as, as concrete and tangible as possible, that you're actually making progress in terms of some of the uh, challenges that you're talking about. Uh, well, it, um, I hadn't thought of the adjective gauzy, but um, uh, it's certainly uh, harder to quantify and uh, that in itself provides us with a real challenge because uh, as anyone who's dealt with the public or with Congress knows, uh, metrics are uh, always uh, desired and so it's very hard sometimes to quantify uh, the progress you're making. Um, but I think we are uh, um, making some progress. I, I, I'll be the first to admit that um, uh, the US government over the last 10 years has uh, really engineered a revolution in terms of the uh, kinetic part of uh, and the law enforcement part of counterterrorism. And when I was working on counterterrorism in the uh, uh, last two years of the Clinton administration, you know, we never could have imagined that we would get as good as we are now. Um, and uh, my hat is really off to, uh, you know, people in the, to the intelligence community, to people like Bill McRaven, uh, to Eric Olson, who spoke the other night. They've done an extraordinary job, uh, really far beyond anything we could have expected. Uh, when you're dealing with the attitudes uh, and the uh, orientation of uh, human individuals out there, uh, it's, I think, a quite different and uh, hugely challenging problem. And I don't think any of us would claim that we are uh, anywhere near that level uh, that, the, um, that the operators have achieved. Um, but I think we are making some progress. There's a, a lot of uh, common uh, understanding of the, of the nature of the problem in the uh, administration. That wasn't always the case. Uh, I think that we recognize uh, a couple of things. We, communications is part of it. Uh, we have recently stood up in the State Department a Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications. And uh, that's going to, uh, it's making a difference already, we think. We're, uh, we have. Uh, a team of people working digital outreach who are challenging extremists online in a far more aggressive way than anything that's happened before. We're putting out a lot of video content uh, that I think is also stirring the pot in an important way. We also recognize that we're not going to um, move, the dot, move the needle here on, on the radicalization phenomenon only through communications because there are a lot of people who are beyond reach of a conversation, and they're certainly not going to talk to us, and they're not going to look at anything that's coming from uh, the U.S. government in terms of how they think about uh, the world and how they think about the bin Laden narrative. And so we think that there's also uh, more work to be done in terms of developmental uh, interventions that will reduce the drivers of radicalization. And AID has been working on this uh, for a number of years, and uh, they are doing important long-term developmental work that's reducing radicalization. In my office, we're also working uh, on new um, endeavors to do very targeted interventions in hotspots, because radicalization often happens in hotspots. And so we're trying to uh, build the analytic base and figure out what we would do to change circumstances in a neighborhood, in a city, uh, perhaps even in a, in a part of a province, so that um, uh, people will not be attracted to the uh, Al-Qaeda narrative. I, I want to get to that point about uh, development, but uh, before I do, um, let me just uh, throw this at you. Um, 
uh, about attitudes, because I think the, the latest Zogby poll on Arab attitudes toward the United States is not very reassuring. It suggests that America is less popular now uh, than it was at the end of the Bush administration. Uh, I said less popular. Um, how, how is that possible, and is it, is, is it, is it did, we, did, did President Obama raise expectations with his, with his Cairo address, and then that hasn't been ful fulfilled, or how can you explain, um, I mean, that, that suggests we're going backwards, not forwards. Uh, yeah, I have to say that, you know, you can find polls to support pretty much any uh, generalization about how we're doing in a part of the world as long as large as the as the Muslim world. So, uh, I think there's uh, you know a question about the utility of such polls. I, I think you're also talking about a period in which, uh, in many countries, people are uh, exercising new muscles in terms of expressing their opinions in a way that they couldn't before. So, I, th I think we would make a mistake in in laying too much emphasis on a particular poll that there has been a structural problem in terms of uh, uh, views of America in many of these countries for a long, long time, though, uh, is not news. And, um, you know, as if we saw the discontents that uh, prom promoted the uh, Arab Spring, uh, you know, it's not surprising that uh, a lot of people have a lot of uh, uh, negative feelings at the moment. Uh, I think it was on Thursday in the first session, Mike Leiter, uh, said talking about making a point about soft power and a softer approach to counterterrorism said I think his words were we are not the United States is not uh, optimally uh, resourced uh, and optimally organized to take the um, counter radicalization fight overseas um, and uh, the strategic uh, message overseas um, uh, what do you say to that well, I agree with Mike. We've been working on this for a couple of years. Uh, I, I think that we all understand that we have a, um, a bureaucracy that is optimized for um, one kind of uh, counterterrorism, but we need to be uh, optimized for more than that, and that's really the transformation we're trying to uh, bring about. And as I said, um, it's easier if you can, uh, you know, uh, hold up uh, a, a if you can hold up a raid in Abbottabad, then if you're doing the incremental, uh, very difficult work of trying to figure out what the message is, trying to figure out what the right vectors are for transmitting it, and then um, you know, figuring out how you follow it up, it's, a, it's an iterative process. It takes a lot of work, and uh, I think that uh, we have an enormous amount of uh, work to do ahead of us. This, this, I mean, this has been something that our own internal uh, evaluations has shown time and again, and um, uh, I think that this is um, uncharted territory for any government, uh, certainly since, since the end of the Cold War, and I think that the kinds of um, tools that we need are in many ways different from uh, that period, too, so we're, we're having to innovate a lot. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, Arab Spring, and I want to ask a general question. Um, uh, I actually want to first get you to respond to something that Steve Hadley said yesterday. Um, which he, he gently criticized the Obama administration for not supporting this revolution uh, in a comprehensive and an organized way um, and, and said, and these are essentially said, and these are my words, that the president is whiffing on this historic opportunity. Well, let me begin by saying that I fully agree with Steve Hadley on the importance of the Arab Spring. Um, and I, I, view, I want to say that on, on two counts. On, the first count, obviously, um, to see so many people demonstrating, uh, making clear their aspirations, have better lives, and to be able to exercise uh, their rights is inspiring. And uh, I think we in the administration all fully agree with Steve that this has to be uh, at the center of our uh, activities, and we need to do what we can to support these aspirations. Um, I would say from a security perspective as well, we're uh, very much heartened by it. Uh, obviously, these are revolutionary developments, and you never can be fully sure where a revolution is going to go. But um, I think that from a counterterrorism perspective, uh, this is just tremendous news. Uh, people who have a stake in their own government uh, and um, live in democracies that you know create this room for greater dissent are going to turn to violence a lot less. That's uh, uh, 
that's one thing. The other thing is that the irrelevance of Al-Qaeda to what happened in the Arab Spring has been manifest, and that has been, uh, I would contend, a blow on par with uh, uh, the raid uh, in Abbottabad. Now, as for the contention that uh, we aren't doing enough, um, perhaps not surprisingly, I disagree. Uh, <laughs> we are doing quite a lot. Um, it's not the case in, uh, in a set of events like the Arab Spring that you necessarily want to be showcasing everything you're doing. These are, um, I think one of the ambassadors yesterday said it's a lot about nationalism. Nationalism isn't necessarily a, uh, uh, a movement that you can effectively steer from the outside. You know, we've, done, we've made lots of commitments on the economic side. Um, one can argue whether uh, we should do more, and uh, the Congress, of course, will have to, I think, uh, uh, examine that question very closely, whether they're going to appropriate uh, more money to support uh, activities uh, related to the Arab Spring. Uh, the President has certainly been very forthright in, uh, in his uh, speeches about uh, how much we support what is going on out there. And I think we've been very uh, active in terms of uh, our diplomacy, uh, in terms of supporting what's going on in Libya, supporting the aspirations of the Syrians, a very difficult diplomatic problem uh, because of where the Russians and the Chinese are. Um, you know, I think it's still early days. I think we're doing well, quite a lot. Explain on, on Syria, because Steve Hadley mentioned the Syrian people, who I think he called the most courageous people in the world, who are coming out uh, you know, every Friday um, in large numbers at, at great risk. Mm -hmm. Thousands of them have been slaughtered. Um, speeches about aspirations, is that enough? Well, uh, you know, the obvious question is, uh, uh, do we want to be involved in another conflict like that? Is that a place where uh, the U.S. has a, a, a more active role to play? We are working very, very hard at the U.N. to um, uh, make life more difficult for the Assad regime. The, we have put our own uh, sanctions, uh, you know, increased our own sanctions on Syria, which was already one of the most sanctioned countries uh, on earth. Uh, the number of tools that we have uh, for dealing with this are, are quite limited, uh, but at the same time, I think we've been quite clear about our support for uh, what it is that uh, the Syrian people want, and, and uh, we think that they ought to be able to uh, chart a better future for themselves. Let me ask you another question about the Arab Spring and the context of counterterrorism, and you alluded to this, that in times of turmoil and, and, and chaos and dramatic change. There lurks danger beneath the surface sometimes, and sometimes not just beneath the surface. How worried are you about that? I mean, there are, you know, are there weapons sloshing around some of these countries, the potential for prison breaks, uh, uh, security services that are in disarray. Isn't it possible that things from a counterterrorism perspective could get worse before they get better? Uh, there's no question that it is um, that there are a lot of things going on that uh, are very worrisome, and let me uh, recite a few. Uh, intelligence services, some of them have uh, disappeared. Uh, there are a lot of lo loose munitions. There have been a lot of jailbreaks. There are a lot of people on the loose, and we know that there's great interest on the part of Al Qaeda and, uh, and uh, its adherents in terms of what is going on in these countries. And if the revolutions themselves have underscored Al-Qaeda's irrelevance, then not surprisingly, Al-Qaeda wants to demonstrate its relevance. And so they do have an incentive uh, to try to carry out attacks. And these are very fragile things, these kinds of transitions. And um, uh, you know, a wave of terrorist violence would uh, have a severe impact on what is going on. Let me say that you know, these are, in some ways, challenges that we should be glad to have because I think that the, the basic trend line is right and uh, we've been criticized by some up here for not having strategic patience. I think we do need to have patience for these developments. I would also add that while uh, some of the uh, monitoring and surveillance that uh, uh, we would rely on to ensure that terrorists aren't doing bad things in these places uh, may not be there, uh, you have to think it's also a positive thing that some of the very repressive Mukhabarat uh, organizations in these countries are either not there or are on the run, because we know uh, that repression is one of the key drivers of radicalism. And so, um, you know, this is a difficult situation, um, but I think that there is a, a hopeful outcome here. Yemen is obviously one of the places that you're most worry worried about. And I think you testified a few days ago on the Hill um, about 
uh, what's going on, particularly in the South, uh, uh, towns like uh, Zinjibar falling uh, to uh, Islamist rebels, um, the potential for uh, uh, AQAP to gain access to the strategic waters in the Gulf of Aden, and potentially uh, Aden, uh, uh, the city of Aden fa falling. Um, how worried about about that are you? And 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 if if Aden fell, for example, wouldn't that be a strategic game changer? Um, well, it's always nice to know that people are reading your testimony. Um, <coughs> first of all, I, I agree with uh, uh, Ambassador Al Saidi. I don't think Aden's going to fall. Uh, Aden is a uh, a large city. It has a lot of uh, it has a lot of defenses. We don't think that's going to happen. At the same time, uh, you never want Al Qaeda to control territory. Uh, that's, that's clearly uh, not in anyone's interest. And to the extent that this churn is allowing them to pick up fighters along the way, either from tribal militias or whoever else is disaffected and wants to uh, enjoy a, you know, a piece of the excitement, uh, that's obviously uh, bad news. And that's why we think it's so vitally important that um, the transition gets moving in Yemen. And we've been very... Uh, uh, candid about that. We think that the plan that the Gulf Cooperation Community has put forward is a very good one, and um, it's time for, uh, for us to move to the, the next stage of, of uh, development in Yemen. Uh, clearly, Yemen is uh, a challenging place. It has enormous uh, economic and demographic problems, some of which were touched on uh, yesterday. And as long as we have this um, you know, this hiatus, this inability to really uh, have a government there that, that can act, uh, that knows where it's going, uh, it, uh, it slows down what needs to be done uh, in counterterrorism. I mean, I should, I should say, I think we're confident, as the ambassador said yesterday, that um, uh, whoever, whatever kind of new government emerges in Yemen will be a, a partner in counterterrorism. I think we're quite confident about that. I think the Yemeni people understand uh, what's at stake. Uh, but uh, to have uh, this kind of indecision and to have uh, a lot of the uh, security actors distracted uh, is bad news. And as we know, AQAP is one of the most dangerous actors in the world, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. It's shown it, wa it's shown it wants to attack the United States at home, both through the December 25th, uh, 2009 uh, conspiracy and through the printer cartridge conspiracy. And these are uh, dedicated terrorists, and they really want to uh, show that they can uh, do it as well. You say it's time to move to the develop, development phase, but aren't we a little bit late uh, in Yemen? Uh, I mean, you know. I, I said the, de the next stage of the government's I see, development. Okay, I see. Uh, clearly, development is an ongoing major challenge in, in Yemen, but to underscore our approach to counterterrorism, I think it's important to note that in, in dealing with Yemen, uh, we have uh, spent a lot of uh, a lot of resources on training up Yemeni security forces. I think we spent 170 plus million dollars last year, which is up from, uh, I think, less than five million uh, before we came into office. And um, uh, additionally, uh, the uh, curve for uh, humanitarian and development assistance is quite, um, quite steep as well. Uh, it's, it's harder to, to get there as fast because absorption capacity isn't there. It's very difficult now, of course, because we can't operate on the ground. But this comes out of a, a clear understanding that unless we attack the drivers of radicalization in Yemen, um, in governance, in economic development, uh, we're going to have uh, an enormous problem for a long time. Our economic aid has been hovering around 50 or $60 million, which is about the... No, it's about $100 million. That's what it... For, for fiscal 2000, okay. So that's what it costs to, you know, two fighter jets, essentially, right? I mean, it's not a lot of money, given the fact that uh, this is uh, very likely uh, the point of origin uh, for the next attack on the United States. Sorry, and I understand I'm resources my business, are- business cards here, it's bad, <laughs> bad business. Um, look, you can, you can uh, talk about um, uh, the resources, this is a big, it's a, it's a significant amount of money in the context of Yemen, first of all. Second of all, what is really important is not just that we're putting money up, but that we are uh, marshalling the international community, and there's been the Friends of Yemen process. Um, obviously, the, the, the key stakeholders in this are the Saudis, the Emiratis, those right in the neighborhood who have significant 
resources and we're going to put up a lot more. But uh, the EU has been quite committed. Um, you know, the resources, um, I don't think anyone has all the money that is going to be necessary to, fi to fix all of Yemen's problems. But the resources are not going to be the impediment if we can get to uh, a functioning government and uh, a clear prospect for government policies going forward. Um, let's move to um, AFPAC, and, and I want to talk a little bit about the drone program. I think the euphemisms have outlasted their usefulness. Um, uh, John Brennan, uh, a few weeks ago, when he unveiled mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, the, uh, the uh, administration's new counterterrorism uh, strategy, um, uh, said that in the past year or so, there has not been a single uh, civilian death uh, attributed to that program. And you can debate whether that's true or not. Um, I think there's a lot of reporting that suggests that the, the uh, uh, casualties are uh, fairly minimal. Um, but you operate in a world of perceptions. Um, and uh, among uh, uh, the, the uh, Pakistani population, uh, they believe uh, that uh, large numbers of civilians are dying all the time. Some of this is even stirred up by the government. Um, and there is a perception, which has led to uh, radicalization of some terrorists, that this is uh, you know, indiscriminate uh, killing of Muslims. Um, so how do you, uh, uh, as a State Department official, uh, deal with those perceptions and try to counter them? Well, of course, it's a program I can't talk about. So how I counter the perceptions is even more challenging. Um, <laughs> Let, let me begin by saying, first of all, Doug Lute and I, uh, or I, I am in Doug Lute's category. I really, there are some things I just can't talk about. The perception that the United States is carrying out unilateral actions that are um, very much detrimental to particular populations, especially in South Asia, obviously is not helping uh, um, attitudes there. Uh, and it would be nice if there were fewer uh, sources of misinformation uh, on this issue. I will say that in dealing with governments around the world, uh, this does not come up. So um, on a government-to-government -government basis, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is not the problem that it appears to be uh, in the press. Um, let me ask a question about the, uh, the relationship with Pakistan, which has obviously been in a, in a downward spiral. spiral. Um, Osama bin Laden, uh, many people believe, was, uh, was, was sheltered in, in Pakistan's equivalent of, of, uh, of West Point, or a town that has West, uh, uh, their equivalent of West Point, um, possibly by elements of the government. Um, obviously, that's not fully known. Um, the uh, ISI continues to run uh, or give aid to terrorist uh, organizations that they consider uh, important to their foreign policy um, interests. Um, Pakistan provides a haven um, to the Taliban, which uh, uses it to kill NATO forces. Um, why should we continue to, uh, to give the kind of aid that we do to Pakistan? I know that's being debated uh, and there are threats being made, but we're still giving a lot of money to Pakistan and explain why we should be doing what I think a lot of people would, would think is uh, uh, encouraging this kind of bad behavior. Um, well, not, not for nothing has my boss called this a challenging uh, relationship. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we have actually reduced uh, some of the numbers recently, as you, you know, on the military side. But I think that the uh, important thing, and here I'm coming back to some themes that uh, Doug Lute uh, touched on yesterday, is that um, there is not an end to the problem of uh, Al-Qaeda uh, in South Asia without uh, a partnership with the Pakistanis. We may make more uh, inroads in terms of disrupting the organization, but ultimately this is Pakistan Pakistani territory, and it's going to take Pakistani forces uh, to essentially hold this territory uh, and to prevent the group from uh, reviving, which we certainly ass assess it is possible uh, it could do. So it is in both countries' strongest and deepest interest to continue to 
find areas where we can cooperate together, uh, to get over what um, has been called by many the trust deficit, which goes back 40 years now, and uh, you don't overcome a 40-year problem in six months, and we just have to keep working at it. Um, we do not have the luxury to just walk away and say, okay, well, we got bin Laden, that's the end of that. Al-Qaeda in the uh, Fatah is still capable of carrying out terrorist attacks, and if the pressure were uh, diminished, uh, I think we would see them capable of carrying out quite dangerous attacks sometime soon. So uh, we do have uh, lots of issues to work through, um, but uh, a, a cooperative, democratic, capable Pakistan remains uh, a core interest. Uh, the President said this, uh, the Secretary said this, and uh, you know, we believe it uh, throughout the administration. Uh, David Headley, uh, a Pakistani American who was convicted uh, of um, you know, being involved in the Mumbai attacks, casing the sites where the attacks took place, uh, testified in, in, uh, in, in federal court as a government witness uh, that uh, his handler, essentially, was an ISI officer. Um, and the ISI has been tied in other ways to those attacks as well. Why shouldn't Pakistan be placed on the State Department's list of state, sponsored, uh, uh, state sponsors of terrorism? Uh, well, um, first of all, it takes a lot of, as a general rule, we, we try not to use that instrument um, too hastily because it is uh, a blunt instrument and it um, is very hard to get countries off the list and it doesn't necessarily incentivize them to do the right things. We have told the Pakistanis on many different occasions that we uh, need them to do a better job on some of the groups that are uh, operating within their borders. Uh, Lashkar-e Taiba, which Headley was affiliated with, um, is uh, at the top of the list. And um, I never tire of saying that, although it's not Al-Qaeda or even really an Al-Qaeda affiliate, it is one of the most dangerous groups on earth, and the consequences of another Mumbai-style Mumbai attack uh, in India are incalculable and uh, would be devastating to stability over an enormous uh, amount of territory that comprehends two nuclear-armed states. So, um, you know, uh, we continue to have to uh, work this issue uh, as best we can, and we have Lots of areas, again, citing Doug, lots of areas of cooperation and other areas of uh, some frustration. Um, but I don't think we have the luxury to uh, throw up our hands. Has uh, the, the prospect of putting them on that list ever been used um, or since you've been in office? Uh, you know, um, I think we would call that internal deliberative materials. <laughs> so maybe we won't talk about Is that. Is that a non-denial denial? denial? Uh, that's a modified <laughs> hangout. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Uh, let me ask about one other uh, area quickly, and then we'll start to open right. it up to questions. Um, uh, the, the administration sort of charitably um, has had mixed results on, the, uh, uh, on, on sort of fulfilling its rule of law agenda. Guantanamo remains open. I don't think anyone thinks that uh, it'll be closed uh, during uh, President Obama's uh, term. Uh, uh, the Attorney General Holder had to backtrack on, on uh, civilian trials for the 9-11 defendants. Um, what impact uh, does this have as you travel around and meet with your counterparts? What impact does this have on our, on our global relationships? Um, uh, and be as, as uh, specific and concrete as possible. Um, <clears throat> You know, you just had a session on WikiLeaks. You don't need me to be uh, as concrete as possible. Um, it is certainly the case that, uh, on the one hand, we are committed to closing Guantanamo. And as John Brennan said in his speech uh, a few weeks ago, that we consider Article Three trials to be one of the most important and effective tools in combating terrorism. Someone, I think it was perhaps Yul Dikakova or Richard Barrett talked about the deglamorization of terrorists through uh, rule of law uh, approaches, and I wholly agree. It, this is an absolutely essential part of our toolkit, and we need to have it. The politics have obviously become very, very difficult. It is difficult for me because one of my main 
jobs is to go around the world and tell other countries that we really encourage them to use rule of law approaches. And particularly now in the context of the Arab Spring, when uh, we're having uh, conversations of this nature and saying that uh, we stand ready to help countries go transition from emergency law uh, regimes to really using the rule of law, this is a key issue. And I don't think anyone really wants uh, to have uh, more repressive uh, domestic intelligence services or the military conducting uh, untrammeled um, uh, counterterrorism operations in all these countries that we're concerned about. So this is a key message. And in fact, my office funds resident legal advisors in a number of different countries and works with them on legislation, on training of prosecutors, training of judges. We spend a lot of money supporting UN and other uh, organizations that do similar programs uh, with rule of law institutions around the world. And anything that undermines uh, our ability to make that argument is obviously unwanted. So I think it's, it's really important uh, that we uh, be able to use all those tools in the toolkit. And uh, it would certainly help me as I uh, go around and try to get people to uh, uh, deal with their terrorist problems in a way that we think will have uh, long-term benefits. This is a little nasty on my part, but wouldn't it help you more if this administration, if this is such an important if issue, if this administration uh, uh, had made this more of a priority? Um, I mean, the United States hasn't taken a single uh, detainee from Guantanamo, m maybe one, uh, Gailani, um, which, of course, undercuts uh, our efforts to get the Europeans and other allies to take uh, detainees, which undercuts our ability to close Guantanamo. Um, uh, after there was congressional opposition uh, to the KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed decision, I think it's fair to say that the White House did not aggressively get behind that. And you want me to hold on to my job? Um, uh, you know, I think I've said how strongly I feel about uh, um, the rule of law approach. I am personally glad that we now have caught uh, Warsami and that he is going to face an Article Three trial. And so I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, all right, one last softball highbrow question for you, and then we'll open up to the yeah, promises, promises to the right. predators out here. Um, it's a question about Egypt, um, and I, but I think it stands for a larger proposition. American national security officials for many years now have had to deal with the sort of uh, uh, Islamist uh, dilemma, which is to say that we want to promote democracy in these countries. On the other hand, we don't want uh, 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 Islamic um, parties to come uh, to power. Um, in Egypt, the Islamic Brotherhood uh, is... Uh, the best organized um, political force in some ways, the best organized opposition force at least. Um, what is our posture uh, toward the Brotherhood? We can talk specifically about Egypt. You can broaden it out if you want. And are, do we have contacts with them? To what extent are we engaging with the Brotherhood? Uh, I, I, I think you mischaracterized a little the past or the, the position. Um, uh, we certainly have had uh, leaders from Arab countries in the past say to us, you know, uh, I'm all that stands between uh, uh, an extremist uh, government and, and uh, that you ought to support me for that reason. I think we have been telling a lot of these uh, leaders, not necessarily in public, but quietly for many, many years, that uh, in fact their autocracies were not sustainable. With, uh, in terms of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, again, I think it was uh, the ambassador who said yesterday, it's different in different countries. Obviously, Hamas, which is a chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood, is very much not an organization that we want to uh, engage with until they abandon violence uh, and embrace the quartet principles. On the other hand, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt has not been involved in a violent attack that anyone has document, documented since the 1970s. And our position is that anyone who is prepared to support uh, a democratic, uh, pluralistic future, to abide by constitutional values, 
and for whom democracy means not just one but repeated elections, ought to have uh, an ability, a, a place at the table to discuss uh, the future of these countries. And obviously, it's for these countries to decide. Uh, over the years, uh, our, our contact with the Muslim Brotherhood has varied from time to time, depending on a lot of different factors. Uh, I believe that we always spoke with those uh, members of the, of the uh, MV who were in parliament as independents. Uh, I believe now it is at the discretion of the ambassador. Um, but we do feel very strongly that um, you know, Egypt's courses for Egyptians to determine, uh, and our own role in that is uh, to be as supportive as possible and to engage with groups that are looking for peaceful democratic let evolution. Me, let me ask it this way. Has there been a policy change in terms of uh, our posture toward the, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt from the previous administration to this administration? I think the context policy may have uh, changed uh, slightly, but um, uh, again, in the past, I mean, I remember visiting Cairo during the last administration, and at that point there were contacts, and there are contacts now. So exactly what the fine points of that uh, are, I'm, I'm uh, not in a position to say. Okay, since you brought up WikiLeaks, I actually have one last <laughs> question, because you make a brief cameo uh, in the uh, WikiLeaks uh, uh, cables, and a rather colorful one. Um, you weren't the colorful one. It was uh, the president of Yemen, um, who said to you um, when you were visiting him, you Americans are hot and hasty when you need us, but cool and British when we need you which sounds like something you would read in T.E. Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Um, can you tell us anything about the context in which that uh, re remark arose? No. <laughs> All right. I just wanted to read the quote. Uh, can you tell us um, what you think is going to happen uh, with uh, President Salah and whether he is uh, likely to regain power in Yemen? Uh, again, I think that uh, President Saleh has expressed his desire to go back to Yemen. Um, we think that it is really high time uh, to get on uh, with uh, a transition, the transition that he promised. And um, uh, it is safe to say that he has been hard to predict over the years. So. But is it, the, is, it, is it the policy of the United States government that Saleh not come back to Yemen uh, to take over the government again? Uh, it is not our place to uh, either tell him or the Saudis uh, who, where, and he is now, of course, in a Saudi hospital, um, what he can and cannot do. We can advise, but we don't uh, tell anyone what they can and cannot do in a situation like that. Okay. So, Questions? Uh, in the back, Catherine, I think. I think it's not on. Catherine, whoa. <laughs> Catherine Courage, Fox News. I have uh, two related questions. Maybe you can help me understand um, why this White House has placed the American Amwar al on this killer capture list where they're effectively judge, jury, and executioner, yet at the same time you're supporting Article Three courts and wanting to bring the 9-11 suspects who are all foreign-born to a New York City court and give them the presumption of innocence and full constitutional rights. And second, Anwar al alaki had uh, a very colorful history here in the United States. He was picked up at least three times for soliciting prostitutes and for loitering around an elementary school. Yet why in this uh, Kenner narrative that we're trying to prepare has there been no effort to use this information to undercut him to uh, potential followers? Thank you. Um, well, let me begin with your first question, which I have to say is, um, Forgive me, deeply confused. Um, Anwar al, first of all, we don't talk about uh, any uh, particular hit list. Anwar al is a terrorist who has been involved in some uh, truly scary conspiracies. We have made public that he was intimately involved in the effort to uh, bring down the Northwest flight going to, uh, um, going to Detroit on December 25th. Uh, he is a uh, leading 
member of uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and um, you know he is obviously a very dangerous person. As for uh, whether or not one can um, uh, have unilateral counterterrorism actions abroad while supporting Article Three courts uh, at home, the answer is obviously. Obviously, we should have all the tools in our toolkit, and I think even uh, Attorney General Gonzalez said this before, uh, we need Article Three courts, uh, we need military commissions, we need law of war detention, and we need to have the ability to defend ourselves against imminent threats. Uh, all of these things, uh, I think, are recognized under international law, and uh, we are, you know, I think, foolish if we limit our uh, limit our options in these cases. And of course, um, you know, we have always taken the position uh, that we will act in our self-defense when there is not a capture option. So I think that sort of speaks for itself. Now, as for uh, the issue of what material would be used or not used in a particular uh, effort to denigrate someone, I think, um, and I haven't been involved in discussions on that particular information. The information is out there. You can hardly go on the web without seeing it. It really uh, probably doesn't need the United States government to give it any more uh, velocity. You can see his mugshots on the web anytime you want. And you have to ask the question of whether the US government putting it out wouldn't in fact undermine uh, the power of that information to a lot of those people we most want to uh, persuade to uh, not to follow him, not to listen to his uh, sermons and the like. So every one of these cases you have to uh, take differently and you have to figure out whether it makes sense um, to do that sort of thing. I refer you to the Department of Justice. <laughs> Uh, over here. I'm uh, Chuck Wagner from Mission Central Personnel. Ambassador Connie made two comments yesterday I would like to get your response to. Uh, the first is that we're, we as a government are doing nothing to counter the message of Al-Qaeda, not to governments, but to the worldwide population of potential recruits. And the second is that in dealing with Pakistan, we don't listen to them very well. We give lots of advice. How would you respond to that? Uh, we are trying to... Uh, counter them. I mentioned before the Counterterrorism Strategic Communications Center. We set it up. It, it operates uh, in two languages. One is Arabic, one is Urdu. We are very much targeted on that, uh, on that effort. Um, it is a hard target because it is a very uh, full uh, media environment there, and there are an awful lot of very, you know, anti-American actors uh, in that space. So it's tough to do, but we're doing our best. And uh, you know, we recognize the need to get our story out uh, into the Pakistani uh, media. Um, as for, you know, not listening, I mean, what do you think? Uh, of course we listen. Uh, we have to listen all the time, and there are times that we just can't agree. And listening and not agreeing is not the same thing as not listening. And I want to also uh, correct something that Ambassador Haqqani, who I have a great deal of uh, respect for, said yesterday, which is that we never talk about the losses that Pakistanis have suffered. I have probably made that point 20 times in speeches in the last two years. John Brennan made it in the speech that he gave uh, rolling out the uh, national counterterrorism strategy. Pakistan has suffered grievously, and the Pakistani people have suffered tremendously from uh, radicalism in their midst, uh, and we are fully conscious of the sacrifices they have made. Um, it is absolutely not true that we're unaware of that. Uh, I think we, we honor that, uh, those losses uh, quite clearly. Right there. Stuart Bernstein. Uh, I haven't heard too much in lately about Iran and uh, what are we doing to counter their efforts in with Hamas and Hezbollah and other 
areas of uh, terrorism? Uh, it's an excellent question. Iran remains the preeminent state sponsor of terrorism. Um, I think that in the se session on terrorist finance, you can find out an awful lot about that, but we have been very active in designating individuals and designating banks uh, and uh, making it ever more difficult for Iran to get uh, access to the international finance system so that it can uh, finance its terrorist activities. Uh, we um, continue to work with partners all around the world to, um, uh, to get them to prosecute uh, operatives who uh, are in their uh, jurisdictions. We had our own trial here uh, in, uh, I believe, in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, we are uh, working hard. I am personally talking to other uh, um, government officials from other countries all the time and trying to get them to uh, increase the pressure on Hezbollah. We have an issue here because, frankly, um, most of our partners view Hezbollah as being a part of the uh, landscape in um, uh, the political landscape in Lebanon, and they are reluctant to uh, essentially, in, or in their terms, alienate a third of the Lebanese population, but we view it as one of the most dangerous terrorist groups on earth, and it needs to be uh, countered. And, um, you know, we never hesitate to raise our, uh, our counterterrorism issues uh, about Iran and to uh, continue to work with the different sanctions regimes we can to constrain them. Is that Sean in the back? Uh, Sean Waterman from the Washington Times. I, I wanted to ask a question, Ambassador, about other nations' use of the, uh, of the toolbox that you spoke about earlier. Um, for many years, the uh, United States banned Tariq Ramadan from visiting because of his, uh, <coughs> because of his alleged links to, uh, to terrorist organizations and has designated uh, media organizations uh, associated with Hezbollah as, as uh, terrorist entities. Do you think that the Norwegian government should ban Robert Spencer and Pam Geller and try and get the Gates of Vienna or Atlas Shrugged or some of these other anti-Islam blogs that helped inspire Mr. Breivik? Uh, do, do you think they should do that? Every country has its own legal tradition and has to make its own decisions based on the freedom of uh, expression that they, uh, that they have. Uh, you know, we, ha we distinguish in our law between actual incitement uh, to commit a crime and, uh, and hate speech, which we may not like, but which we tolerate. And that's really for Norwegians to decide. Other questions? Uh, I have another one. Um, the, uh, during the Cold War, uh, we, um, uh, the, uh, it was sort of a rather binary uh, equation. You had people who were uh, with the Soviets, people who were with us. Um, you obviously had not aligned, but uh, it was a fairly clear and simple environment. In, in the War on Terror, you're dealing with a, with a much more complex, multilateral environment. So how do you manage those coalitions, um, and how do you deal in that, in that much more multilateral environment? Well, um, let me make a couple of points. First of all, uh, I think the unsung story of the last decade is the amount of international cooper cooperation there was. Uh, with the exception of Iran uh, and uh, Syria and uh, perhaps a few other countries out there, the amount of solidarity uh, in the global community against al-Qaeda has been extraordinary. And uh, even if there were conflicts at the political level, there was often, uh, in fact, quite typically, cooperation uh, at the intelligence law enforcement uh, level. And I think that that's a great story. Um, we, um, I think, have identified uh, <clears throat> the multilateral world as, a, as an area in which we can really get um, a multiplier effect out of the things that we're trying to do um, because lots of other countries are more or less on the same page we are about key issues in counterterrorism. That is to say, building capacity so that uh, other countries have the police forces, the judiciaries, the border guards, um, the institutions they need to really contain and, and diminish their terrorist threats, countering violent extremism, 
Uh, we have taken it upon ourselves to hold quite a number of international conferences on best practices, um, but there needs to be a more, uh, I would say, coordinated international effort. So one of the things that we have done uh, is that we are uh, unrolling a new uh, multilateral organization uh, this September called the Global Counterterrorism Forum. There have been efforts to capacity build in the past, um, but they were not terribly successful. Often uh, bilateral efforts were more effective. Uh, in particular, the G8 had one, but it was viewed by many other countries as being a Cold War relic and not something that they wanted to deal with, particularly in the developing world. So we have reached across the aisle, and uh, as it were, and um, have brought together uh, the key G8 partners and some other uh, Western donor countries, along with uh, a lot of very influential uh, countries in the Muslim world. Uh, the Turks are our co-chair. Uh, the uh, Saudis are involved, the Algerians, uh, the uh, Jordanians, Indonesians, Pakistanis, Egyptians, and the like, as well as um, some of the big powers, China, India, Russia. And uh, um, we have seen just an enormous amount of desire to work together and to use this instrument as something that we haven't had before, which is a place to come together, have national experts identify urgent needs, you know, do it, the agenda setting, bring together our experts to actually devise solutions and then mobilize resources. Now the UN has lots of good bodies that do capacity building and we imagine a lot of the work will go on through the UN. Uh, the EU is also part, I should underscore, uh, and uh, the EU has been a very constructive uh, partner in putting this thing together. And so we're very hopeful that we can really make the capacity building agenda uh, a central uh, part, a central issue for the uh, international community. I mean, everyone's short of cash, but I think we all know that if you're looking at the Sahel, you need to do more to prevent Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb from having a breakthrough and from uh, being able to attack Europe as it, might, as it might like to. We need to do more in the Horn where there are huge border security problems and where Al-Shabaab has now shown an interest in acting out of area, out of Somalia. Um, there continue to be serious challenges in maritime security in Southeast Asia. So there is um, just an enormous amount that we can do and uh, we really feel that this is uh, taking us to a new level. I mean, the, the president has underscored in his strategy how important the capacity building function is. We see that in Yemen, we see that in, uh, in, in our activities in a lot of different countries. And uh, now, you know, through international coordination, we think we can do a lot more. So uh, uh, both the president and the secretary are, are very optimistic about this. Good. Oh, another question in the back, Josh. <coughs> Hi, Josh Gerstein with Politico. It was said yesterday that terrorism is really a middle class person's activity and not a, a poor man's gain. Does it follow from that that poverty is therefore not relevant to the fight against terrorism? And how much of the U.S. development effort around the world, <clears throat> as adjusted after 9-11, is focused on poverty? And how much is focused on other aspects of development? Um, it's a key question, you know, uh, there's an old, uh, uh, old saw uh, that um, revolution is the leisure of the theoried classes. Um, and uh, it is certainly true that the um, preponderance of international terrorists do not come from impoverished backgrounds at all. In fact, there may be people like Mohammed Atta who uh, managed to go abroad and go to university in Germany. Uh, someone like Abdul Muttalib, who um, you know, was maybe not the brightest candle on the cake, but still uh, made it to uh, London for, uh, for schooling, um, and on and on and on. However, that, um, that notwithstanding, poverty is important, uh, first of all, because it provides foot soldiers for insurgencies, which can create churn and, uh, and territories that, in which there can be safe haven. But it's also instrumentalized by terrorist groups. And you know, a key part of the Al-Qaeda pitch really is that the Muslim world has been uh, subjugated by the West and is impoverished because the West is always stealing, for example, its oil, wealth, and uh, other assets. And so that general sense of grievance uh, which is often related to uh, poverty, 
uh, is an important part of the, of the ideology. Um, it is, it is, development is a good in its own right, of course. Um, we do not necessarily think that, that the, num the most direct way to eliminate terrorism is to end hunger around the world. Uh, that's important, again, for its own right, but um, it is absolutely true that we should not conflate um, poverty as a key driver uh, of, of radicalization. Yes, Laura? Where are we looking at? Uh, thank you, Laura Liswood, uh, Council of Women World Leaders. Uh, the World Economic Forum has put out what's called a gender gap report, which looks at the gap of resources given to boys and girls, men and women, in economics, political participation, health, and education. And they looked at 134 countries. And the bottom 10 countries, well, the most bottom, 134th, was Yemen. And then if you go up another nine, almost all of them are Middle East countries. Do you see any correlation here? between what's going on in these positions, if you will? Well, it's an excellent question. I think that we understand, certainly the development community has been uh, underscoring the, uh, how important it is to get um, uh, girls and women into schools and into the workforce, and that this uh, is an essential component for stability across the board and for building uh, economic uh, growth uh, and for stabilizing society. So it seems to me, uh, natural that you would uh, see some of those correlations because when where women are uh, completely out of society or isolated, then you're going to see a lot of these problems. I think uh, we act, we are very supportive of um, a number of organizations that have tied um, uh, an anti-radical, uh, counter-radical message to all kinds of uh, um, assistance um, for women. For example. For example, mother-child care uh, has been a great vector for delivering uh, a counter-extremist uh, narrative. W women who get this kind of assistance uh, have been you know, given the, essentially the understanding that if their kids are uh, uh, recruited to go off and fight for the Taliban or something, you know, it's going to hurt them. It's going to be a disaster for their families. Uh, and so uh, there, we believe that there is a lot that you can do uh, in this area. My colleague, uh, Milan Verveer, who's the uh, Secretary Special Envoy for Women's Issues, is, is uh, quite interested in this, as are we. Um, and uh, we've actually sponsored a number of different kinds of seminars and things to, uh, with uh, women in, in Iraq and other places that uh, focus on these issues. It's an enormous area um, to uh, try to get a foothold in. Let me ask one last question, uh, which just occurred to me, which is that um, your role, your mission, you're obviously is in support of, of uh, the United States foreign policy, but does the State Department not also play some role in countering violent extremism in the United States? I'm thinking about some of these communities uh, that are uh, maybe more vulnerable to radicalization, immigrant communities uh, in uh, Minneapolis, for example, or. Uh, some of the kids in Virginia who fell under the sway of Anwar al awlaki and you obviously bring a certain expertise to dealing with um, these kinds of communities. Uh, we do not play any formal role in anything that goes on domestically. We're prohibited <coughs> by law. But having said that, you know, State Department officials uh, give speeches. They're allowed to do that kind of outreach. Or the fundamental work in terms of countering violent extremism belongs to the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, U.S. Attorneys, DOJ, um, but my colleagues do, uh, you know, go off and, and speak in some of these communities and encourage them uh, to keep an eye on their kids and make sure that they're not uh, falling under the influence of uh, of extremists and um, not getting involved, you know, with dangerous groups and so on. So, you know, we're still uh, we're still hewing to the law. Of course, it's a globalized world. We're doing things online. Uh, those things are accessible uh, here. Um, you know, we're, I have to say, we're really innovating a lot of different ways, and these things may get picked up on, on websites. We're doing, for example, a crowdsourcing project now in Somalia where we get kids out there um, who uh, want to send in, uh, you know, an improvised video or something on a counter-extremism theme. And I have no doubt that 
someone in, in Minneapolis may be logging in on that sort of thing, but uh, our primary audience remains abroad and has to for uh, statutory reasons. Great. Well, thank you, Dan Benjamin. Thanks for uh, talking with Pleasure. great clarity and thoughtfulness about an aspect of the war on terrorism that sometimes gets thank less you. attention, but it's hugely important. Thanks, everybody.